So uh, this week we've been discussing the structure of the bacteria cell. We started out where we distinguished between both the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell. And we've now been focusing on some of the distinguishing features of the bacteria cell. So we've talked in detail already about the structure and some of the appendages and attachments that we can find on the bacteria cell. But I wanted to uh, introduce a couple more concepts here. So we're clear that bacteria are classified as prokaryotes, all right? These are unicellular organisms. They lack uh, membrane-bound organelles, the true nucleus, and so forth. You should certainly have this in your notes by now. Um, they also lack some of the other structures that you'll find in the eukaryotic cell, again, like the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, and so forth. And so we refer to the bacteria cell as a simple cell type, okay? Um, the uh, characteristics of bacteria that we have sort of started talking about a little bit of, we've mentioned it, is that these organisms can be potentially uh, pathogenic, okay? Um, most of them are capable of independent uh, metabolic growth, so they can be considered as a living organism on their own. However, there are a couple of exceptions which are bacteria but they are obligate intracellular organisms okay so if i were to ask you a question about whether or not all bacteria types can exist uh extracellularly or independent of a host then you should understand that the answer is false all right there are a few exceptions chlamydia uh, rickettsia are types of bacteria that require um intracellular host um, we know that in terms of size, these are very small organisms. Uh, we do need a microscope to visualize an individual bacteria cell. What we see when we're looking at a Petri dish with agar on it that we refer to sometimes as plates, bacteria that's growing in plates that we can visibly see with the naked eye are actually colonies of bacteria. So we're talking thousands and millions of cells that have actually um, colonized that plate and those are what we're able to see with the naked eye we're, we're looking at colonies that contain um, several thousands or millions of bacteria cells that have um, multiplied okay so one of the things that we have not talked about is bacteria morphology. Okay, write down this term morphology, M-O-R-P-H-O-L-O-G-Y. Morphology is another term for shapes, okay? Bacteria can exist in various shapes and arrangements, okay? Um, cox, 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 cocci, okay? Bacillus, Vibrio, spirochetes, these are all various shapes that bacteria can exist in. You do need to be familiar with these. As you're in a general microbiology class, you do need to be able to identify different bacteria morphologies and arrangements. Okay, so cocci is sort of a circular a, a structure, right? These cells are going to be in a circular structure and they can exist in chains and clusters okay chains and clusters all right so you've probably heard of the term streptococcus you've probably heard of the term staphylococcus staphylococcus are the bacteria that you can find um normally inhabiting your skin okay um bacillus those are rod shaped bacteria all right, the model organism E. coli is a bacillus. It is rod shaped, okay? Um, Vibrio is sort of rod with like a curve. It's like a curved rod shape, okay? The spirochetes are kind of like a, a sp spiraled shape, if you will, spiraled morphology, okay? You do need to be able to identify these, all right? So coccus, bacillus, uh, vibrio, and spirochetes. So in terms of morphological arrangements, again, bacteria can 
arrange themselves in various clusters and chains and, and so forth. And so the term uh, diplo would refer to two clusters, okay? Diplococcus, all right? Streptococci, staphylococci. We've already been through the structures here. I'm not gonna spend a lot more time laboring over those, but you should certainly have these structures in your notes now. Um, the cell envelope, okay, um, which has the flagella and pili attached to it. You need to be able to identify and distinguish between these structures as well as what their functions are. We talked about the fact that some bacteria have a capsule and this capsule is very important when we start thinking about uh, pathogenicity, being pathogenic, okay? These capsules can certainly provide protection from um, detection and other host immune responses in order to try and rid itself of these uh, microorganisms. The plasma membrane, we're clear, is a structure that's common to all cell types, okay, is the, is the first barrier of protection around the cell that separates the cell itself from the external environment. The cell wall, this is a very important structure that you need to spend some more time with and being able to distinguish between cell wall types of uh, amongst different bacteria. So we talked about the um, peptidoglycan layer, a little bit on last class, and it is the major component of the bacteria cell wall. And depending on the gram stain, the bacteria can be identified as either gram positive or gram negative, depending on the makeup of that cell wall structure. Okay, there are LPS. Uh, found in the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. And then we have these tachoic acids that are found in the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria. So from a structural standpoint, if you see some diagrams and so forth, and you just need to be able to determine if this is a gram-positive or gram-negative, we um, will look for the composition of that cell wall, if it's thick or thin, and if it has those LPS uh, protruding or the tachoic acids present. Talked about the various uh, cytoplasmic structures, uh, the other inclusions, and so forth. There are surface appendages we're clear about. Again, the flagella, which is the organ of locomotion. Uh, these pili are aiding in attachment. The, uh, uh, other, some types of bacteria can be identified by the number of flagella that are projecting from the um, surface of the bacteria. So this example right here is a monotrichous uh, organism because it has only one flagella protruding from the surface, okay? Um, there are many different other types and arrangements of flagella that can help us to identify bacteria. All right, so we know that the pili are these thin sort of short hair-like projections on the surface of most of the gram-negative bacteria. Um, they can come in two types, they can be short, and some can be long, but these are sex pili that are aiding in um, they're aiding in, oh, I just drew a blank. Um, they are aiding in the process of conjugation. Oof, I drew a blank there, conjugation. All right, um, so this is an example of a sex pili that's basically aiding in conjugation in the exchange of genetic material between two um, bacteria cells. Um, the pili, again, I said it's a factor that aids in uh, a, a attachment or uh, interaction between neighboring bacteria cells, okay? It can adhere to various surfaces, okay? Um, the capsule, as I mentioned, is an important structure that can 
uh, be a factor of uh, pathogenicity, okay? Um, the capsules that are present on bacteria can help us um, in terms of determining virulence. So both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria can contain a capsule, okay? And these capsules, again, are conferring resistance to uh, host immune responses such as path, uh, phagocytosis and is, is basically providing protection and escape from the immune system. And it also um, prefers, confers some resistance to other antimicrobial therapies that an individual may take in order to try and get rid of the bacteria. So we talked already about the cell envelope, right? We know that the cell envelope is a general term that includes the cell membrane as well as the uh, outer structures of the plasma membrane and cell wall. So real quick here, what we didn't go into great detail about already is the function of the plasma membrane. We've talked about it from a general sense, but we do want to understand that A, the plasma membrane functions to separate the cell from the external environment. And then in this case, bacteria has additional uh, barriers that we'll refer to as the cell envelope, right, with the cell wall and the, the outer and inner membrane structures. Um, so it's a barrier, right? And this barrier functions to also uh, regulate the passage of material into and out of the cell, okay? This is a very important point that you wanna note that these cells, these are living organisms. And so we do need for there to be passage of material into and out of the cell, okay? But this plasma membrane functions as a selective barrier that's going to regulate or selectively allow certain uh, things to permeate the membrane and other things will not. And this is due to the structure of that membrane that we've talked about already by it being this uh, phospholipid bilayer, right? And it's this arrangement of phospholipids in this uh, bilayer organizations, two layers of phospholipids, and these phospholipids have an arrangement that allows for certain substances to pass through, but other substances won't be able to easily pass through. We gave you examples that gases and water and so forth can easily pass through the cell membrane via osmosis or diffusion. We'll talk about some uh, transport uh, in another uh, uh, lecture, um, but um, the membrane, so, so things that can easily pass the membrane doesn't require any assistance, but then there are other larger, more complex molecules that also need to pass through this membrane, and it requires some assistance. So we'll look at forms of active transport, and it's basically by way of these uh, proteins that are going to be embedded in our membranes that provide sort of like an opening or a channel for larger, more complex molecules to uh, permeate the membrane and get inside of the cell, okay? And so, and so the point we're making right now is that a lot of things are happening at this membrane level, all right? It's serving as a barrier. It's regulating the passage of materials through the cell. It's um, providing a means for things to get through by way of uh, transport, facilitated uh, and facilitated diffusion and active transport where we have our membrane embedded proteins that provides sort of a gateway or a channel for the passage of molecules into the cell. So the cell envelope, again, we're talking about the plasma membrane and the cell wall, all right? The cell wall is a rigid structure that maintains the shape of the cell and prevents it from sort of bursting, if you will. Um, here is the new point we're making today. We're talking about the two major types of cell wall, right? We can have the gram positive cell wall or a gram negative cell wall, okay? And this gram status refers to an experiment that we would do in the lab, which is basically a quick uh, sort of colorimetric assay that we do um, to determine if this organism is gram positive or gram negative. Okay, 
gram positive organisms are going to retain it. So we're basically going to add a series of dyes to a microscope slide that has been um, formatted with bacteria. So we add these dyes in a series of steps. So we're adding dyes or kind of washing it off and we follow the steps and then we visualize it under the microscope. And depending on whether or not these cells stain purple or whether they stain pink, we can determine the actual structure of the cell wall. So the gram positive cell walls are going to stain purple. Gram negative cell wall will stain pink and we'll talk about that process in just a moment, okay? There's one type of bacteria that, that, that do not um, uptake the dyes that are utilized in the gram stain. So we have to do a different type of staining procedure to identify these. And an example are the mycobacteria and mycoplasma. Okay, mycobacteria have a um, acid-fast stain wall and we have to do a different type of um, assay to determine that, okay? Mycoplasmas do not have a cell wall and therefore we do not distinguish between these types of organisms with the gram stain procedure, okay? So really quickly, I do want you to understand the gram stain, okay? Uh, this gram stain is a very uh, useful tool for us to quickly identify an unknown culture in terms of classifying the, gram, the, the cell wall structure. If we wanna just generally know if these are gram negative or gram positive bacteria, we can do a gram stain. It takes about five minutes. And again, what we're gonna do is basically fix uh, bacteria onto a microscope slide. And we're gonna add a series of stains to the microscope slide, just add a few drops, okay? Um, this uh, procedure was invented by Hans Christian Graham, and so it's then called the Graham stain. And it divides bacteria into two main groups, either Graham positive or Graham negative. Again, keeping in mind that there are a couple of outliers all right, the mycoplasmas and mycobacteria that do not necessarily um, respond to this type of a stain. Um, and so the gram stain, again, is reliant upon us being able to detect the cell wall structure, okay? Gram-positive bacteria are going to have a thick peptidoglycan uh, cell wall, and gram-negative bacteria will have a thinner uh, peptidoglycan cell wall structurally. So when we do the gram stain, uh, naturally bacteria kind of don't have a color, right? They appear sort of a clear translucent color. Okay, so we fix them onto our microscope slide. All right, I do want you to understand this gram stain procedure and be able to tell me how to execute it and interpret the results. All right, so we fix our slide with bacteria cells that we're interested in. Okay, we call that process fixation. And we'll go over that in great detail in the lab. And then we add our first dye, okay? There are four reagents for the gram stain. The first is the crystal violet. Crystal violet is our primary stain, okay? So we're gonna add a few drops of crystal violet to our cells, okay? At this point, both of the cells are gonna appear purple because all we've done is added our crystal violet. All right, you let the crystal violet stay on for about a minute and then we rinse it off. Okay, we rinse it off with dewater and we add iodine. We add iodine as a, we refer to iodine as a mordant, M-O-R-D-A-N-T. This mordant in this process is helping to either to fix this dye into the cell. Okay, so we add iodine. So we rinsed it off, we added some iodine and now we're going to attempt to decolorize these cells, okay? We use isopropyl alcohol for this decoloration step. So we're gonna add a few drops of alcohol to our slides, okay? If these cells are gram positive, after the decoloration step, we visualize these under the microscope. I'm sorry, we decolorize and then we add a counter stain. Our counter stain is safranin. This is the step that, that helps us determine if our cells are gram positive or gram negative. Okay, up until this point, we still don't know. 
So we add our saffronin. We wait another few minutes and then we rinse. We then look under the microscope to see if our resulting stains are purple or sort of a pink reddish color. If in fact the cells are purple, we refer to them as gram positive cells. This purple color tells us that this is a gram positive cell that has a thick peptidoglycan cell wall and it has uptaken the, all of the crystal violet stain that we applied. It's uptake the stain and it retained it during all of the processes of decolorization, okay? Gram-negative bacteria, on the other hand, are gonna appear a pink reddish color under the microscope, all right? And so what this tells us about the cell is that this cell has a, a very thin peptidoglycan cell wall, and during the process of staining, it did not retain that primary stain, uh, crystal violet. It was washed off during the decolorization process, and when we added that counter stain, it retained the colors of the counter stain, okay, saffronin. And so this is a very quick uh, procedure again it takes about five minutes in the lab for us to run through this we're keeping our stains we have four reagents our crystal violet iodine isopropyl alcohol and saffronin we're adding a few drops of each we're rinsing in between we're waiting about 30 minutes to one 30 seconds to one minute for each of the uh, reagents to uh, settle in and then we uh, blot dry and then we look at it under the microscope Okay, and so we're just looking for two things. Are the cells pink or are they red? Okay, um, usually it's a very cut and dry <laughs> analysis. Sometimes we can get some, um, if it's not a pure culture, we can end up with cells that stain both red and purple, all right, which we'll call that a mixed culture because that would indicate that we have present um, both gram positive and gram negative organisms in that culture. So anyway, this is a very important tool in microbiology. It's one of our first go-tos. If we ever have any questions, we're not sure what we're working with. We have this unknown sample. We wanna start trying to identify what this organism may be. We almost always will start with the gram stain because that gives us two broad levels of classification and then we can continue to delineate from there which organisms we may have present, okay? And so these are some uh, pictures of what the results of a gram stain would look like under the microscope. What type of uh, cell is illustrated in this first picture here? Gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive. Gram positive, because they're gonna appear sort of a purple, uh, violet color under the microscope. Okay, what about here? What what uh, type of cell do we have here? What cell type do we have here? Gram negative. Gram negative. Gram negative. Now, I'm t this picture is not the best, but this would also be a time when we're trying to identify morphology. I feel like we can see morphology a lot better in this gram negative micrograph. What what morphology do you think you see in this gram negative image? Look back up at the morphologies that we just identified. What what do you think you see in this image here in terms of the the shape? Streptococci. Streptococci. Um, well, I definitely think it's. I actually don't think it's cocci. Uh, I can't tell. It looks a little blurred. It kind of looks rod shaped to me. It looks a little rod shaped. Um, but it is kind of hard to tell. But the gram stain is one way that we can quickly categorize the organism as either gram positive or gram negative, and we can get a better um, view of the actual morphology, all right? And again, morphology is another way that we can identify bacteria. Thank you. 
So the cell wall, again, we've talked about this peptidoglycan polymer. It is the major makeup component of the cell wall, and it's basically an arrangement of sugars and amino acid peptides. Um, this is a polymer that is unique to bacteria. The sugars that are present are the NAG and NAM, N-acetylglucosamine, and N-acetylmuramic acid. Um, these uh, polymers basically are amino acids cross-linking with sugars. Um, and so this is sort of the basic structure of this uh, peptidoglycan structure and this cross-links of the amino acids and sugars. And so real quick for illustrative purposes, this is a gram-positive cell wall, right? And what we're seeing here is a very thick peptidoglycan layer inside of this cell wall, okay? I mentioned some other attachments, the ticoic and lipotechoic acids. These are unique to our gram-positive uh, cell wall, all right? So we got the you know, cytoplasmic membrane here with our phospholipids. We talked about the phospholipids already. All right, with the polar heads, nonpolar tails. And then we've got some proteins that are uh, interspersed throughout the membrane, some integral and peripheral proteins present. And then we have this thick peptidoglycan layer, okay? Um, the tecoic acids, jot this down really quickly. Tecoic acids are basically a um, polysaccharide that you'll find on the uh, gram-positive cell wall. Okay, it's going to be anchored into this uh, cell wall, and it, it, it can be used as an antigenic determinant to help us identify a, a bacteria. Okay. Gram-negative cell wall. For illustrative purposes, if we look at this schematic again, we've got our membrane, but what we have here is a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. Okay. So if ever you're asked to identify or distinguish between um, a bacteria cell, one of the main properties that you can look for or characteristics is whether or not this is going to have a thick or a thin peptidoglycan layer. Gram-negative bacteria are going to have this thin peptidoglycan layer. This is why it does not um, easily retain that primary stain, the crystal violet, it'll wash off during decolorization because it's kind of a thin layer here and it will stain pink under the gram stain procedure. Um, what we do see here also is this LPS, all right? This LPS is a very important uh, uh, identifier for gram negative bacteria, okay? And it's found in that outer membrane, all right? Let's look at LPS, okay? LPS is a, an important uh, characteristic feature of gram negative bacteria. Okay, um, it is identified as an endotoxin. I do want you to know that it's very important in us being able to, again, distinguish and determine what type of um, organism or pathogen is causing uh, a problem. All right, we have found that uh, Listeria, which is a gram positive bacteria, also contains an LPS. So while it is a distinguishing feature for gram negative bacteria, we have found that Listeria monocytogenes contains an LPS as well. And so LPS is dangerous, okay? It causes a lot of problems. This is one of the uh, virulence factors for the uh, gram negative bacteria, okay? Uh, these are endotoxins. LPS is an endotoxin, write that down. Okay, these are heat stable toxins. They uh, can be secreted in culture. Um, they cause fever and other uh, clinical symptoms that we're able to uh, diagnose. Okay, it uh, has the it has a structure with a lipid, a polysaccharide, and that O antigen. Okay, again, we typically only find them in uh, gram negative bacteria. Okay, but we do need to understand that these LPS or endotoxins can be very uh, tr troubling and cause disease. It can cause shock. It can cause a number of other um, immune responses, okay? And so the toxicity of this LPS is due to that lipid A component that we just talked about earlier. And so you can take some time and read a little bit more about the LPS that's found in the membrane 
of Graham, I'm sorry, in the cell wall or sticking out of the cell wall of Graham negative bacteria. Okay. Well, the pe we talked about the periplasmic space, which is basically the space outside of the um, membrane and peptidoglycan in bacteria. Real quick, the cytoplasm we discussed, that's kind of the whole internal component of the cell, right? It's mostly made up of water, okay? That's where we're gonna find our DNA. Um, that's where we're gonna find our plasmids. There are though no uh, organelles or membrane bound organelles gonna be found in the cytoplasmic of a prokaryotic cell, all right? Um, the single circular chromosome that we find in bacteria, again, is gonna be found in that nucleoid region, not a true nucleus. Um, and then we talked about the extra chromosomal DNA that are present in some bacteria. And they are important because they usually confer some type of antibiotic resistance. All right, so that nuclear region is sort of a uh, area, if you will, a structure that's gonna contain our um, single chromosome, right? We, we already know or we've distinguished that bacteria are unique uh, genetically in that they do not have multiple chromosomes. There's only one chromosome in the bacteria that's responsible for producing all of the uh, genes to encode this bacteria cell, okay? Um, all right, so we talked about this nucleate region, which is where we'll find our DNA. Okay, the other important structure inside of the bacteria cell that we cannot negate are the ribosomes, okay? These 70S ribosomes, these ribosomes are responsible or the place of protein synthesis, okay? These are gonna be these circular uh, arrangements that are dispersed throughout the bacteria cell, okay? The endospores, some bacteria have endospores, which again are just kind of another a protective barrier that helps the bacteria be resistant to antimicrobial actions, okay? It can be resistant to heat, which we know heat is one of our main modes of um, trying to get rid of bacteria, okay? Like when we autoclave them and so forth, we're using uh, very high heat temperatures. Or if we're in the lab and we're like streaking or something, we can like flame our needle in an attempt to kill any microorganisms that may be present. So we rely on heat. Unfortunately, endospores can be resistant to this heat, okay? Uh, endospores can confer resistance to chemicals, desiccation, and a lot of other things that we try and do to get rid of them, okay? Um, all right, I'm gonna stop here. What questions do you all have? I know this was a lot of information, but I wanted to go ahead and kind of wrap this up today. I will post these slides for you. There's one more um, 